Hello and welcome to ESG Talk, your go-to source for insights and advice from leaders in environmental, social and governance. I'm your host, Andy Wood. In today's episode, we're going to tackle the topic of sustainability communications. The NYU Stern Center for Sustainable Business collaborated with the Edelman PR Agency on a study of environmental sustainability claims that best resonate with consumers. As part of the research, they surveyed nine well-known consumer brands. There's a lot we can learn from this research, and here to share insights from the study is Tonsi Whalen, the director of NYU Stern's Center for Sustainable Business, who is now a three-time guest on this show. Also joining Tonsi is Jackie Murphy. At the time of the study, Jackie was a managing director for Edelman Impact, who helped clients define their authentic purpose and sustainability strategies through actions and communications. She has since left the agency, but we're excited that she's agreed to join us today. Okay, so today we have Tonsi and Jackie. Thank you both very much for joining us on the show. Thrilled to be here. Absolutely. Brilliant. So before um, we dive into the findings of this joint study, uh, let's start by giving us our listeners some background on sustainable marketed products and what that means. So I know that in partnership with Sakana, NYU Stern CSB has been tracking the market for consumer packaged goods marketed as sustainable and publishes the Sustainable Market Share Index. And your index is a positive sign for sustainable products. So how have those sustainable products fared over time and in the face of inflation? Yeah, so um, thank you so much for having us. Delighted to be here. So we have been looking at actual consumer purchasing of sustainably marketed products. Basically started look, doing this with Circana back in 2018, but looking for data back to 2013. Started doing this work because we kept hearing about this green gap. People saying they want to buy sustainable products and then not buying it or not being willing to pay a premium. But when I asked where's the data, all the data was surveys, right? And we know surveys are notoriously unreliable. So with Circana, we've been looking at every single purchase. They've got barcode data for every single consumer packaged good product in the United States sold in everything from mom and pop to Target and Amazon e-commerce bricks and mortar. Several hundred thousand SKUs we're looking at each year. What we have found is that sustainability marketed products are growing twice as fast as conventional at a 28% premium on average. And we've seen this continue to happen, you know, so when we first started looking at this, there were, you know, a number of categories that were under 5% sustainably marketed. Many of them have moved to between 5 and 20%. Those that were between 5 and 20%, many of them have moved to over 20%. And what we saw is during, while the premium used to be higher prior to inflation, 38% and higher, which I think is actually too much because we want everybody to actually purchase these products. Inflation, um, um, the commitment to purchasing sustainable products has continued. We've also seen less price sensitivity, more customer loyalty in the research that we've done. Honestly, that that idea that, you know, there's been such a massive boon in sustainable market share was one of the things we were aware of when we were looking to do this study. And I think it's something our clients are certainly aware of. And they're sort of looking at how do we get a piece of the pie, right? Like a lot of our clients are these mainstream brands. They're not necessarily born sustainable. And they're looking to figure out how do we introduce new products or make our existing products be positioned as more sustainable. But it's sort of how do we help our clients start to get a little piece of the pie of that growth. And just to support, add on to that, one of the things that we saw in, in our research in the sustainable market share is that the category growth happened uh, in a significant way when a legacy brand who has the scale came in with sustainable alternatives. So it generally starts, as you might expect, with smaller, more nimble brands whose whole purpose is around sustainability. And then as they develop that proof of concept, then we start to see these legacy brands come in. But they don't often know how to do it, which is, is exactly Jackie said, is, is sort of why we then got together to do that research. So it sounds like it's sustainability is relevant in new product development. And you've talked there about new products from directly aiming at just starting as sustainable and big brands adding sustainable products. Is that a sign that sustainability is becoming more important in product development and new product development? Or is it just that it's reflecting the fact that the market is, is shifting that way in a sort of a more of a natural way? Are there other forces going on there that are driving this? I think it's both and. I mean, we so the what we saw the last time we looked at this was in 2021, but we looked at it several years prior. 
And every year, a larger percentage of products were sold, new products were sold with more sustainable attributes. So by 2021, one out of every two new products sold in CPG had sustainability attributes. So there's absolutely a focus and a recognition that this is an, a business opportunity. I think it also reflects companies doing more sustainable sourcing, more risk management around some of the issues, right, which then they can express in a consumer-facing claim. Jackie, what are your, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think that the the innovation and the new product development is where a lot of the excitement is, right? Because when you're, you know, you're solving a problem, um, you know, we know consumers are looking for reusable or sort of products that use less waste. Um, we know that consumers are looking for more concentrated formulas. We know that consumers are looking for plant-based options. So the innovations in formats, I think, are where it's almost easier. I think where many of the mainstream or, you know, candidly, all brands are struggling is how do we make the sort of standard things that we've always made just that little bit better? Kind of like the incremental progress is almost where the sustainability journey is harder. And so I, I do think innovation is where a lot of the excitement and the kind of blue sky thinking is happening. I mean, this wasn't on the, the list, but one of the things that was striking me as we were talking just there is I'm wondering at what point we start to see the sustainable products replacing some of those old brands, or are we seeing the old brands themselves evolve to the point where that there's no need to replace because they are now the sustainable product? Yeah. Both, right? I agree with Tanti. Both. Right. <laughs> yeah. I always, I do like and as an answer to many, many things. Um <laughs> So we've covered that consumer demand for sustainable products is growing, but also I think everybody's aware that it needs to accelerate if we're going to create a more sustainable world. So that context sets the foundation for your collaboration with Edelman on a research initiative about sustainable marketing. So you partnered with nine big brands, including Mars, North Face and Unilever. So what were you both hoping to address through this initiative? You know, I think that idea that there's there's this boon in growth, this sort of exponential growth happening in sustainable market share, but there are so many companies that are still grappling with how do we put sustainability at the core, not only of our innovation strategies and our, our business planning, but our communication. So there's there's many things that companies will do to sort of innovate or improve upon the sustainability of their products that may not get communicated to consumers, but there are some things they do that absolutely have to be communicated to consumers. And unfortunately, right now, many companies that we talk to, especially those that aren't that don't fall into that category where, you know, they're known for being sustainable, many of those sort of legacy or mainstream companies aren't communicating sustainability benefits to their consumer audiences. And there's many reasons for that. Sometimes it's because there's, you know, this fear, this sense of the rising backlash, or, you know, sometimes it's because they're worried about greenwashing. But actually, one of the concerns we hear the most often is, we just don't know what works. We actually don't have a good sense of a roadmap of what kinds of you know, consumer messages are resonant or relevant to consumer audiences. And so that just felt like a really easy problem to solve with this study. Yeah, I think Jackie's summarized it really well. This is really our interest. And that interest for me came out of the work I did running Rainforest Alliance, where I worked with, you know, personally, I worked with hundreds, but we worked with thousands of companies to help them with their sustainable sourcing and then with their claims with the Rainforest Alliance certification. And what I saw over and over again is that companies really didn't know how to talk about this, you know, um, and their firms that they hired often didn't know how to talk about it and would put in place problematic messaging, which then didn't drive purchase. And they blamed it on the sustainable the sustainability of the product, not necessarily on the poor messaging. <laughs> so I got, you know, I got very interested in that. And then um, we brought on a terrific consumer insight specialist, Randy Kronthalsako, who used to be a CMO at uh, Johnson Johnson, has a lot of great background. And she um, really has developed this work and worked closely with Jackie and others at Edelman 
to design the, the research that we're going to talk um, with you about. But so it was a way to really contribute to helping companies better think through how to engage customers with authentic claims. So I think both Jackie and I would stress that this is not about telling you how to greenwash better. <laughs> it is about how to communicate what you're doing that is real better. That's going to come up a lot. <laughs> I can tell in advance. So let's let's dig into these findings then. So across all nine brands, sustainability claims significantly expanded brand reach by bringing in new consumers. But you found that sustainability claims that ladder to relevant category claims are the most appealing. And actually, this question here talks about unpacking, which is a Brit isn't a term I usually use, but it does feel really appropriate in this context. Could you unpack that for us and give us an example of what you mean? Yeah, so... The methodology of the study was to test the salience of different claims, all environmental claims, I should stress, and to force choice regular over and over again, choosing between a variety of different sustainability claims as well as basic product attribute claims. So we wanted to understand how these sustainability claims performed against those. And so we learned a lot about which sustainability claims worked well, which we'll talk more about. But what we also found, and this you know, makes sense, right, is that for the most part, in looking at these nine different iconic brands and a variety of different categories, for the most part, people want to make want to understand first the core attribute of the brand. You know, nobody wants to eat ethics. <laughs> they they want to eat cho good chocolate that is ethical, but they don't want to eat ethics, right? So you got to start out with what is the you know this yeah, delicious chocolate, but then what we found is that. With the right, we can talk more about this, with the right sustainability messaging, you can move purchase intent substantially with an additional two sustainability claims on top of your product category claim, moving from 44% purchase intent for product category claims to 60% plus an additional sustainability claim to 74% plus an, a two additional sustainability claims. So really exciting insights. Yeah, and maybe I can give an example there. You know, I think a brand that's doing this really well is Hellman's. So, you know, Hellman's has built its whole platform around the idea of make taste, not waste. So its entire brand is being built around this idea of positioning itself as helping consumers eat tasty food and not waste their food. So that's a social issue. It's an environmental issue. You know, food waste is a really, really big contributor to climate change. It's a huge problem. But... It's also deeply personal. It's a, it's a big driver of cost savings in the home if you can reduce food waste. And the way that they talk about it always really centers around the personal and around the really focusing on that category driver of taste. So, you know, we make our mayonnaise with 100% sustainably sourced oils for great, creamy, rich, delicious taste. Our vegan mayonnaise, plant-based, same great taste. And they really, you know, they show the sandwich. It looks delicious. Everything they talk about, it's really leading with a factual claim, what they're doing, but it's, and then following up with why, and the why is all about what's in it for you as the consumer. And the fact that there's that environmental benefit is really more of like a tertiary benefit that's kind of implied. Interesting. So, um... Having sort of seen the results, we're definitely getting into now what it is that consumers do care most about. And it certainly sounds like one of the first things that they care about is that this is addressing them directly in some way. Is that a, w a fair way of putting it? Yes. What we found is that really, you know, consumers are self-oriented. <laughs> um, and so they're looking at what's in it for me, my community, and then, you know, my world, right? So what we saw is the the best performing claims focused on saving me money through laundry detergent that um, is cold water wash and doesn't use energy, through apparel that I can have repaired, right? It focused on healthy for me and my family, milk made without bovine growth hormones or a product without chemicals, um, made without chemicals. It focused on um, children and our children's future. It focused on, you know, not in this way pets, but animal welfare, right? Which we know is driven by people's concern about pets and sort of more broadly animals. Um, and then the final two were around support for local farmers 
and 100% sustainable sourcing. And that last we were a little surprised by because we thought, you know, it might need explanation, but it actually didn't. People got 100% sustainable sourcing and they thought that was a good thing. So those were the kind of major categories of the claims that performed really well. Anything associated with that, again, building in most cases on the core attribute. And Jackie probably has some great examples to Yeah, I think one thing, just hitting on that point around working with local farmers, we have so many clients in the food sector and food industry who are are trying to crack the nut of how do we talk about our commitments in the regenerative agriculture space? And, you know, they're doing so much. And it's it's a really complex and layered topic of, you know, restoring soil health and working to create the system, you know, and, and it's an incredibly important and impactful topic, but one that it can be quite complex to try to translate and help consumers understand. And when we looked across multiple different brands that participated in the study, it was so interesting to see how when you included that context around working with local farmers, it just humanized it for people. It made them think that's how, you know, it's working in my community. And I think that's a really, it's a great way to hit home that point of, you know, once you make something feel personal and human, People just get it. You can explain the rest of what, you know, how that's about creating a better farming system. You can almost follow that up with any, the rest of the sentence about how that works to create a better and more regenerative system of farming. But if you ground it in, and the way we're doing that is working with local farmers, people are kind they're with you. They trust you. And and I thought that was a, a really interesting way to drive the point of almost the whole study home. Yeah. And, and again, so tying back to the core, you know, working with local farmers to bring you a delicious and healthy you know, product, right? Yeah. And it just, it all works. It's lovely. I'm sitting in the middle of a load of fields. I am surrounded by local farmers. And I think I've also seen quite a lot of this messaging over here as well. Do you think that your findings are in something that could be used more internationally? Or do you think some of them are very specific to the U.S.? Something we've talked about a lot, and it's something we we, um, would love to, to sort of replicate the study again, I actually think that the principles of this, you know, people think the the idea that you would want to really focus in on people's personal motivations, I think would be quite consistent globally. I think what those motivations are may look slightly different market to market or culture to culture. So there may be nuances that would be incredibly interesting about, you know, is it local farmers everywhere? You know, farming is such a deeply rooted kind of, there, there's so much love for farmers in the U.S. There are in many cultures, but maybe there are other communities that come through really strongly. So there, there may be really interesting nuances, but I would suspect that this idea of making sustainability resonate deeply personally and the kind of what's in it for me would be consistent in any market where you tested it. So obviously we now know what works, but what about the claims that did not resonate with consumers? So I've got an example here of consumers not being as concerned about the science behind sustainability, which actually on a personal level with a science background doesn't surprise me, unfortunately, <laughs> but also not packaging, which did a bit. So uh, could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, we were we were interested, to put it that way, in, uh, in what performed least well. And in fact, scientific claims, things that even felt scientific, like words like biodegradable um, or carbon neutral, it did not perform well for the most part. And what did work, again, is if you articulated it in a way that brought it home to the consumer. So biodegradable, okay, what that means is the waste will no longer be going into your air and drinking water. If you focus on it that way, rather than the biodegradable, then you're more likely to kind of get interest. But this was the challenge around anything related to climate, biodegradable, things like that. Another area not of interest was traceability. Could not care less about whether this was traceability. I think, again, goes to that more technical kind of thing. Um, Did not care so much about most certifications, What we say there is that what that means is don't drop your certifications because they're your authenticity, right, to help you with any charges of greenwashing, et cetera. But you need to explain them with the right verbiage as opposed to just rely solely on slapping a certification logo on pack. And then the other one, as you mentioned, was packaging did not perform well, with, except for one that performed middling, which was 100% recycled content, which 
interested me because it tells us that actually consumers are a little smarter <laughs> than sometimes we may think they are. Because, you know, if something says 100% recyclable, that's all very well, but it may not get recycled, right? Um, so there's, there's, I think there's a fair amount of skepticism about some of those claims. So it was interesting to see that, it, at least on that one, consumers were supportive. Yeah, I, I just want to pick up on that point about certification, because I think it's so important, exactly as Tansi said, to not interpret the findings as saying you shouldn't have the certification because as positioned, it doesn't resonate I think it just further underlines the importance of having the what and the so what. Because for many of many consumers, if you don't recognize what you know a specific certification is, you need the context of what that means. So it coupling, you know, seeing a few of these logos that may look credentializing to you, but what that means for you and what that means about the product as a result. I think there's there's usually a really good way to combine, you know, those certifications as something that credentialize your approach that will resonate with a certain group of highly informed consumers with a more broadly appealing message that will help the majority of people understand, okay, now now I get what they mean, um, what these kind of symbols and things unpack that I may not be deeply familiar with mean when I'm choosing this product. And so you also considered how sustainability claims perform with different demographics, as you would, including generations, gender, political affiliation, family size, education, income, all the usual. But um, obviously, we're going to start asking about generations because generations are one of the areas where we hear a lot of focus. So how did you find the different generations talking and, and thinking about buying sustainable products? Yeah, and this is interesting because one finding actually ties back into the claims that didn't work as well. So first of all, big picture, the claims that worked well worked across all demographics. On the generational front, uh, what we saw is that Generation Z responded better to scientific claims related to things like climate change than the other generations. And our thoughts on that are that perhaps that's because for Generation Z, climate change and the science of it is personal, <laughs> right? Because this is what they're dealing with, right? So that may be why there's there's more focus. We also saw, you know, Democrats um, slightly more interested in this, but only, you know, just a slight more men slightly more interested in certification. But overall, just a, a broad kind of support for these messages. Yeah, I, I really think that the headline, you know, we were expecting a huge part of the narrative to be about what messages resonate with income levels and, you know, generations and spending so much of the time unpacking those kind of different demographic differences. It's so much of what we do in research. And the biggest headline was how much that was not the story and that the story was the, the top performing claim for each and every brand resonated universally well across all demographics. And I think to Tansi's point, the most sort of heartening one of all was political affiliation. And so it feels like there's a real unlock here around if you make a claim that is personal and linked to the human kind of benefit of, you know, why sustainability matters to me and my family, and that's connected to the product, you can sort of neutralize this idea that it's somehow coded to benefit to one side of the aisle or the other. Obviously, there are a lot of channels for brands to promote themselves across, and they do promote themselves across all of those channels. Which of those stood out as being the most influential? And does that vary by demographic? We saw that being close to the consumer point of purchase resonated really strongly across all demographics. And this this does chime with what we've we sort of know to be true about sustainability. People want to be educated about the sustainability credentials of a product um, when they're making that purchase decision. So the things that came out really strong, packaging, in-store, you know, for certain categories, sales associates, and then for the sort of promotional channels, this is where the, de the generation slightly varied, and this won't be necessarily hugely surprising, that with older generations, there was a bias for traditional media and TV and even more traditional, traditional social media like Facebook or Instagram. But with younger generations, and particularly Gen Z, TikTok came through really strong. And that 
is maybe not surprising in terms of, of course, Gen Z is on TikTok, but most of our clients are not educating people about their sustainability commitments on TikTok. So the fact that Gen Z was saying in many cases among the top two or three places they were looking to fact check a brand's sustainability credentials was TikTok is noteworthy because brands do need to be putting it out there. So that's that's something brands do need to take away and know. Yes, or, or else somebody else will be putting it out there on TikTok. Yeah, we know they are. I think that that sort of half answers the next question, which was given that we do see differences in audience and channel considerations, how can brands optimize their impact of their sustainability messaging on different channels? And I think the first answer there is uh, be on the channel, but um, is there anything else? Yeah, I think this one, this is sort of general channel guidance. You unpack, there's the credentializing piece and sort of the the what and the why we were talking about earlier. So, you know, 100% sustainably farmed for great taste. If there's a certification, credentializing with the why, the sort of really essential information that someone would need if they're making that decision at point of purchase. You can do more storytelling in other channels. I think on channels like TikTok, you know, and other social digital channels, you really do want to make sure you're expanding and providing context. So claims plus context, right? So that it's, you know, transparency, you know, full kind of authentically giving a little bit more texture to the story so that people feel you're communicating like not only the good and the sort of headline progress about your claim, but maybe the kind of bigger picture of where you haven't fully achieved your goals yet, what this means in the bigger picture of what you're trying to achieve. Because I think, you know, this isn't just solely linked to the study, and we'll talk about this, but it's really important in sustainability as you're trying to earn trust that you're not just kind of communicating this one sort of headline message that would potentially give someone the impression that you're trying to make yourself sound better than you are, that you're really telling the whole story. And so certain channels really lend themselves to telling that whole story better. And so make sure you're using those to kind of go deeper. And if you can, we really recommend including links to those channels in the sort of channels where you don't have the space to do that. So put a QR code if you only have the space to give the headline message so that people can, not everybody will, but you want to show that you're being transparent and that you have all the information publicly available in a place where people can easily find it if they do want to look. Yeah, and we're definitely, I mean, we've been, in many ways, we've been kind of drifting towards trust through a lot of this conversation. We've mentioned certification quite often. We've mentioned authenticity quite often. Obviously, we've already mentioned greenwashing as well. And I think we're definitely getting into how companies can overcome that sentiment. I mean, is there anything else in the research that would help them in this area? Whatever you say needs to be backed up because immediately everybody will come shooting for you and you'll do more damage to your brand. But that you should also be bold and do share because it will, it will uh, matter in terms of what customers are looking for. You know, and the only other thing I would add, you know, in terms of the messaging is that I think um, firms need to be careful about not lecturing and also to use humor, you know, in, in communications because this, and this also goes to kind of some of the work that Edelman's doing. If people become depressed and pessimistic, they're not necessarily going to want to support what you're doing. So, uh, through purchasing it. And in fact, really interesting uh, separate study that we've done found that customers are actually more loyal. So we, we looked at a number of different categories and purchases of the categories when they hadn't tried them before. So trying a conventional frozen dinner versus a uh, sustainable frozen dinner. And they were far more likely to try another sustainable frozen dinner have, after having had the first one than they would a conventional, as an example but they cared less about the brand. So they would go try different sustainability dinners. <laughs> so I'm, I'm saying all this because you want to ensure that your messaging enables you to tap into what people really care about while also, of course, selling a product that delights the, the customer, right? And I think that's really what we point to is it, it, it needs to be an exciting and fun message that makes you feel good about the product in a real and authentic way uh, through the mediums that Jackie talked about. 
Completely agree. And I, I think we'll talk about humor again. I couldn't agree more. I could not agree more about the idea of humor and just bringing the, like, the full spectrum of ways brands can connect with people. We need to bring, you know, it can be emotional, it can be humorous, it can be irreverent. You know, we need all of the different tools in the toolbox. Like that's what marketing and great brand building can do. You know, Oatly is doing an amazing job with this. Hellman's is doing an amazing job with this. Dove is doing an amazing job with it. We need all brands to bring all of their kind of creative genius and every kind of color of the rainbow to, you know, getting people to connect with sustainable choices. Uh, the only thing I might add in terms of, you know, what we saw with trust and, you know, Tansi hit on the idea of um, our, our recent climate trust study showed kind of a worrying increase in sort of this lack of this sort of pessimism that's almost leading to kind of like fatalism of, well, I, I might as well not do anything um, yeah. because they really don't believe any institutions are doing anything. So it's like, well, why should I? And so the importance of, of every company is, of course, building the long-term roadmaps that they need to map toward a kind of the transition. You know, so like a 2050 plan, a 2040, 2030 plan, those are all critical. They're important. But when it comes to to consumer communication, you really need to be showing the actions that you're taking today and communicating those much differently. So it's that difference between stakeholder and consumer communication that feels very intuitive, but actually we see many companies really struggle with. And I think that's something that, you know, what we're hearing from consumers is that they're feeling quite turned off because they're all, all they're hearing is stuff that feels so out there and not happening in the here and now that they they're not trusting the change is happening. So really making sure you're you're showing people the actions you're taking in the here and now to build up that sense of optimism and earn people's trust that that change is is happening and is possible. And a sense that we can do this. <laughs> okay, so let's I think we've we've already talked about a lot and I suspect we've probably covered this, but I, I like asking this kind of question on panels as well as a closing question. What is one key takeaway from the study that you want our listeners of this podcast to walk away with? Uh, and let's start with Jackie. Sure. So I actually haven't said this yet, so I'm glad to say it now. We are talking a lot with our clients about this idea that when you do sustainability right, when you communicate it right, it sells reaffirming that because there's been so much noise around, you know, the conversation around everything from woke capitalism to, you know, the sustainability backlash that it's really important to reaffirm that this study proved what, you know, Sir Connor Research Tansi mentioned has shown and what many of us know to be true, that when you position sustainability properly, it drives growth. And so, you know, we talk about this idea of the amplifier effect. When you couple a top performing sustainability claim with a top performing category claim, it does increase the appeal of your message. It does bring in new audiences. It does, you know, position you for growth. We really want brands to take heart to that message and take it away and just, you know, be putting sustainability communications in their plans for next year and just be planning, you know, to do much more in the area of sustainability communications because it's good, you know, yes, it's good for the world and we need it and it's it's also good for their business. Yeah, I would just add to that great summary that, you know, sometimes I hear from corporates, oh, this is just a flash in the pan. You know, we have these trends, they go back, back and forth and this will go away again too. No. <laughs> <laughs> it won't. <laughs> um, what we have had is, um, you know, I think a bit of a hangover from the 70s and 80s when we had sustainable products that didn't taste good, didn't really work, you know. So there was kind of a negative, you know, there were hippie granola, sort of a whole kind of negative you know, association with them. What we're seeing today is something completely different, right? We're seeing that actually sustainability is driving higher quality in the product. It is driving less risk in the product. It is driving customer advocacy and loyalty. And that is only going to increase as the challenges of the world get bigger. And as these younger generations are inheriting those challenges, they are themselves aiming to come up with the solutions in their careers. And they're aiming to purchase those solutions in their personal lives. So I think, again, you know, don't put your head in the sand figure out how to take advantage and be a leader in this, as well as, you know, then creating a better world for your children and grandchildren through the work that you're doing to provide sustainable products that people actually want to buy. 
as we say so often, look for the opportunities. So thank you both very much again for joining us today, uh, Chauncey and Jackie. A pleasure. Fantastic. To our audience, thank you for joining us for another episode of ESG Talk, brought to you by WorkEva, the world's only unified platform for financial reporting, ESG audit, and risk. If you're interested in learning more about the work NYU Stern is doing to engage businesses in mainstreaming sustainability, I highly recommend you check out our mini-series episode, which highlights parts one and two of our ROI of sustainability series with Tonsi. In the meantime, if you enjoyed this episode, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and subscribe to see future episodes on Apple, Spotify, or YouTube. We'll talk again soon.